All right, well, welcome to the Bedford Bible Church podcast. This is episode number uh, 14, and it is a recap of the sermons that were preached here on July the 5th. And so uh, a couple of weeks behind with this one, uh, God willing, tomorrow I will work on the recap from this week, today being the 13th of uh, July, so I'll recap on Sunday the 12th later this week, hopefully tomorrow, but maybe later in the week. So uh, on July the 5th, then, during the Sunday morning service, we're continuing to go through a, ser- a series of messages on the life of Elisha, and the title for the series is Faithful Nurse in Faithless Days. Uh, Elijah and Elisha served during days when pagan idols were being set up, when the uh, worship of God was under attack, when there were very few faithful believers. And so although society was faithless, Elijah and Elisha and Sarah, you know, many others were faithful to follow after God. And of course, God was always faithful to bless them. And so the text is uh, the same as I had in the previous message with Elisha, First uh, Kings chapter 19 and verses 11 through 21, uh, but with a focus on those final three uh, verses of 19 through 21. So I'll read those. It says, So he departed thence. So Elijah departed, having been given a command by God. He found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him, cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him, took a yoke of oxen, slew them, and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave unto the people, and they did eat. And then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. So today I want to focus on Elisha's character. So throughout this introduction to the life of Elisha, we are taking note of the grace of God that's being demonstrated through Elisha in the way that his character was formed, through the blessings that he enjoyed and then whatever troubles he faced as a a young person, they formed his character. And whatever God does allow in our lives, it can form our character and it's a part of his grace. Uh, We see God's grace in choosing Elisha to serve and we see God's grace in providing Elisha with the courage uh, that he needed so that when he responded, he could continue in obedience. And so my encouragement to you today is to embrace God's grace so that you can have that same courage to do whatever it is God calls for you to do. Now, when Elijah was going to Elisha, these were not easy times for any follower of God, and certainly not for the prophets, uh, for the prophet Elijah. Uh, They were under attack. Victories had been won, yes, but battles were yet unfought. Jezebel was still scheming behind the throne. Uh, Elijah still had a price on his head. Many in the land were still shallow, timid followers of Jehovah at best. And so to become a prophet uh, was not a light calling or an easy choice. I remember reading the story uh, told by Paul Harvey uh, of a man called Ray Blankenship and being attacked by a fly here. So if I start swinging my arms wildly and you're watching the video, then that's why. Ray Blankenship was uh, getting his breakfast one morning and he looked out the window and he saw a small girl, a small girl being swept along in the rain flooded drainage ditch outside of his home in Andover, Ohio. Now Blankenship knew that further downstream there was a, a culvert and where the ditch would disappear underneath it and if that little girl did not get out of the, uh, the, the Russian waters before then, she would almost certainly die. And so Ray ran out of the door, he ran alongside the ditch, and finally he was able to jump in alongside her and grab hold of her. And, you know, he he stuck his hand out, he found a rock or a root or something to hang on to. The forces of the water were trying to tear the girl out of his arms and to pull him back into the water. And his thought was, if I can just hang on until help comes. But he did better than that. By the time the fire department and other rescuers arrived, he had pulled the girl to safety. Both were treated for shock, and on April 12, 1989, Blankenship was awarded the Coast Guard's Silver Life Saving Medal. And so, you know, he demonstrated courage. And this is something that we see certainly in Elisha, and it's something that we need to demonstrate ourselves. And we're just going to look at this uh, with, with the words that are at the end of verse 21. First of all, he arose. He had the courage to begin. Every great accomplishment by any church or any Christian begins with simple submission 
and obedience. I wonder if your journey has begun. Are you even a Christian? You know, the greatest act of courage may simply be a Christian. To admit that you're a sinner in need of a savior. We've all sinned. We've all broken God's laws. You know, Christianity is not something that you are born into. It's not something you can inherit or you can accidentally become. You need courage to humble yourself. You need the courage to step out of line from all the expectations of your friends. And without that admission of, of yourself being a sinner, you will never be able to receive Christ as your Savior. And it's not a matter of needing to do something to deserve to be saved. It's a matter of being willing to receive the free gift. If you have become a Christian, then have you had the courage to begin serving Jesus Christ? What are you doing for God? What are you doing through your local church? What are you doing for others? If you want to begin your journey of faith and, and have the courage to set out, then you need to grow in Christ. Be in the Word and prayer every day. Volunteer in your local church. If you don't know what you can do, then just do something and try and try until you find that task where you're gifted. Uh, and, you know, sacrifice your time and your talent and, talent and your energy. Uh, J.I.R. Tolkien said that the job never started takes the longest to finish. Just begin. Have the courage to start out. Elisha had the courage to begin, and that is courage that we all need. So he arose, and then he followed. He went after Elijah. He had the courage to let God lead. And over and over and over again, Jesus himself said, follow me, follow me, follow me. He, he, in Matthew 16, 24, Matthew 4, 19, John 1, 43, Mark 10, 21, John 10, 27, John 13, 36. You have Jesus saying, follow me and become fishers of men. Follow me and, and give a worldly ambition. Follow me, follow your shepherd. Follow me through life and into eternity. We're to follow Jesus Christ. We're to follow God's wisdom. There's a wisdom that is of the earth, and it's carnal and sinful, and it brings destruction and suffering. But then there is a wisdom, according to James 3, which is heavenly. It's godly, and it brings great rewards. We need to endeavor to follow good examples. You know, Paul said that when he wrote to the church of Corinth and to the Philippians, he encouraged them to, to mimic him, to imitate him, to follow him, even as he followed Jesus Christ. So he wasn't given a, a blanket instruction, you know, do what I do. He was saying, you know, in as much as I follow Christ, follow me. And we need to set up good examples. Elijah, Elisha had the courage to begin. He had the courage to let God lead. He followed Elijah. And, and in doing that, he was following the Lord's command. The prophets in the Old Testament were the, the spokesmen of God. And so as he followed after Elijah, he was following after God. And then finally, he served. He arose, he followed, he served. He ministered unto Elijah. And that's the courage to fight. You know, when Elisha became the, 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 the person being mentored by Elijah, just as Elijah was in danger, now Elisha is in danger. Elijah's ministry began, uh, or Elisha's ministry began by serving Elijah, but soon he would step up and he would be serving in Elijah's place. There is an opportunity for every generation at the right time and in the right place. Elijah would be off of the scene one day, and, and in the next podcast we'll take note of the fact that it could have been as many as 10 or 20 years, but Elisha got into the fight. He had the courage to be involved. He served. He ministered. And just as there was opportunity for Elijah, there was opportunity for Elisha, and there's opportunity for you and for me, an opportunity for everyone of every age. Romans 16 is a tremendous example of that, and um, you know I'd encourage you to look through that list, study out the names, free men and slaves, businessmen and employers, old and young men and women, all in the local church serving God. And so the challenge for us is will we have the courage to begin something for the Lord? Will you stand and be counted for Christ? All kinds of people are standing for all kinds of causes today, but who is standing for Christ? What are you known for? What is your passion? How would people describe what drives you? We need the courage to begin. We need courage to let God lead. We need courage to serve. That man I spoke about at the beginning of the podcast, Ray Blankenship, he showed courage by diving into ra raging waters to save that young girl. But it makes it even more amazing when you understand that Ray didn't know how to swim. And that's what courage is. It's not 
you know, simply doing what needs to be done because you're not afraid. It's doing what is right, even if you are afraid. It's doing the right thing, not in the absence of fear, but in the presence of it. And so I encourage you, have the courage to begin, follow after Christ, let him lead, and get in the battle. Well, again, this is a recap from July the 5th, and this is for the evening message. We are going through a series in uh, the Gospel according to Mark, and we have got as far as Mark chapter 7 here at the church. We've gone verse by verse, uh, all the way up to Mark chapter 7, verse 24. And this message and the next message is titled, Dealing with Dogs. All right, so dealing with dogs. Mark chapter 7, verse 24 it says, From thence he arose and went into the borders of Tyre and Sidon, entered into a house, and would have no man know it, but he could not be hit. For a certain woman, whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard of him, and came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by nation, and she besought him that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it unto the dogs. And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And he said unto her, For this saying, Go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out, and her daughter laid upon the bed. So dogs all the way through scripture get a pretty rough time of it. Um, you know, in many places you'll find dogs referred to as man's best friend. Uh, when you read the, the Bible, dogs do not get that elevated position. Now the book of Proverbs does tell us that the righteous man regards the life of his beast. Adam and Eve at the very outset were to be stewards of creation. And so I believe that Christians ought to be kind to animals. We ought to model good stewardship of all of creation. Uh, but dogs were a, uh, an example, a bad example many times. In Proverbs and in Second Peter, they're noted for returning to their vomit. And that's never a good thing, is it? Uh, in Philippians, Paul is giving warnings about false teachers, and he says, Beware of dogs, evil workers, and the concision. And, and so it's a criticism. It's, it's a name. Uh, the psalmist uses them as a symbol of attackers persecuting the innocent. And so to call someone a dog, as is sometimes the case even still today, it was an insult. And the nation of Israel referred to all Gentiles as dogs. And Jesus here, in trying to... Uh, push the lady's faith to, to try and encourage her to, to make sure she understood um, her position, to challenge her faith. He, he kind of used that word for dog to her. Um, now, these aren't pet dogs that we may think of. This isn't your little puppy that you love and is in your home and you know you take care of and sits in your lap or whatever it may be. You have to think of the idea of a dog here as being more of a wild animal, a pack of animals that could cause you know trouble and harm. Uh, Jesus in this passage has entered into a gentile dominated region. And so while we may kind of step back a little bit when Jesus refers to the people here as dogs, uh, you have to see his actions. His words are trying to prompt faith. You know, he would have never gone there if he had looked upon them as the rest of Israel most likely did. You see, Israel had been chosen by God. They are still God's chosen people. And it wasn't because there was anything about them uh, that God chose them because he saw something in them that he didn't see in anyone else. It was simply by his grace. It was for a purpose. And Israel, instead of being humbled by that, chose to be uh, proud. And instead of seeing that they were to be channels of blessing to the world, as God had promised to Abraham his descendants would be, they became proud. And, and so they referred to Gentiles as dogs, and uh, you know they, they discriminated against them in, in terrible ways, and, and some Orthodox Jews will still do similar things today. But Jesus has come to a Gentile-dominated region because he came to seek and to save that which was lost, whether they were Jew or Gentile, man or woman, old or young, he came to save all sinners. Uh, if you look on a map, Jesus here is in the northern region, and if you look at the, the north uh, western part of Israel, you'll see Tyre and Sidon right there on the coast. Jesus came to the Gentiles. Uh, the first thing then to take note of is that this was a Gentile woman whose daughter was possessed. The, the region, again, it's interesting to note, it's roughly in the same area where Elijah helped the woman at Zarephath. Uh, but you know, to Jesus, her ethnic background didn't matter. Jesus' ethnicity didn't matter to her. What mattered is that he was the Messiah, that he had the power to save. 
And right there, the, the ministry of Christ and all through the, the, the foundation of the church, you have the, the uh, expectation that there's no division in the church. You know, the color of our skin, the sound of our voice, the words that we use, there's no earthly reason for us to be separated in the church. We are all one in Christ. Background didn't matter. She was a mother with a mother's heart. And she came to Jesus, and Jesus, as we read there, was going to answer her prayer. Her daughter is a young daughter, and, and there's a, a warning there for us that the enemy is no respecter of persons. Satan will destroy the young just as quickly, if not more so, than he will destroy those who are older. Uh, this mother uh, was in a, a terrible uh, position because her daughter was suffering. The enemy wants to go after our children, and we need to be on our guard. We need to be wise, and we need to be led of the Lord to protect them. So we move on from a mother's plight to see a mother's prayer. Uh, you know, she was praying for one that could not pray for herself. Uh, you know, and, and as many have pointed out down through the years, where there is a praying mother, there's always hope. You know, parents are mentioned often in Scripture interceding for their children. And as parents, we need to endeavor to give a good Christian education, to give a good example. Some are able to, to home educate. Some are able to put their children in Christian schools. Uh, some uh, don't have that opportunity. They don't have uh, that uh, chance to do that. Uh, and for many reasons, they may be in a public school. But what we do at home is what matters. Whether they're in a Christian school or not, we can give them a Christian education. We must uh, teach them. We cannot give them new hearts, but we need to remove as many obstacles as possible so that they can come to Christ. And a major part of that is prayer. There are many mothers in the Bible who prayed and believed. You have Jochebed in, in uh, Exodus 1 and 2, Moses' mother who you know delivered her son. You have Hannah in 1 Samuel who, who prayed for her son. You have the Shunammite woman in 2 Kings 4 who prayed for her son and interceded. You come into 2 Timothy 1.15, you have Lois, the grandmother, and Eunice, the mother, who are praying for their son and grandson, uh, Timothy. Mothers make a difference, and in the world around us today, you know, there, there's not much importance placed upon the home and upon the role of parents and mothers in particular, but it makes a radical difference to have a godly mother in this world. We then see a mother's perseverance. Jesus, uh, you know, essentially turned her away to begin with. He said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it onto the dogs. But the perseverance in her prayer can be, uh, can be seen here. Jesus is testing her faith. Now, again, he was there to reach them. You know, Jesus was endeavoring to bring the, the good news of deliverance to them. And he was going to answer her prayer. And so, uh, you know, her, her faith is being tested. Uh, the flesh sometimes wants to stop and give up, but this woman wouldn't be deterred. And she responds very wisely, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. And this is Old Testament still in, in the, the terms of dispensation. And she recognized what he was doing, and she persisted. She recognized her place as a Gentile was not the same as that of a, a Jew, and yet she still had expectations for help. There are some who say that the word here used for dog isn't the, 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 the kind of the critical word for a scavenging, mangy mutt, uh, but it was the word for a little puppy, a chosen pet. And so, you know, maybe there was something about the word that Jesus used that, uh, you know, made her sense some kindness. But whatever the case may be, she persisted. The woman appealed to Jesus, and Jesus tells her that her daughter would be healed. You know, I wonder if you are struggling with something today and you just need a crumb from the master's table. Don't give up. Don't give in. You know, press on, pray on, continue on that path and seek the Lord's blessing. And he provides. It's his delight to provide for his children. You know, any mothers who may see this or hear this, you know, you've got a wonderful opportunity. Don't let the world or anyone tell you that you are not doing something vital, that you need something else in order to be fulfilled. You can minister to your family and make a difference in this world more so than in you know, almost any other endeavor. You can change the world by ministering to your children. And the same goes for fathers. You know, it's been said, I don't remember by who, that every other job in the world exists 
so that the family can exist. And all too often we think that the family exists to, you know, develop workers to push out into the economy, but everything around us exists so that the family can exist. And so that's where our priority must be as parents, as brothers, sisters, sons, whatever it may be. Maybe you're burdened for someone today. You are praying. You are interceding for someone else. Then don't give up. Keep praying. And again, it's the Lord's delight to answer all things according to His will. God willing, next, uh, in the next uh, episode, we'll go back to the life of Elisha, we'll pick up on his story, and we'll also come back to another issue of dealing with dogs uh, in Mark chapter 7.